Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to 60 Plus Racing Adventures here from Circuit Park Zanvor in the heart of the Netherlands. Will Vincent here along with David Haynes on Racebot TV as we are getting set for the first of our two races here this evening. Grid, let's go immediately over to that for the first of our two races, and it is Stefan Roosgood on pole position. Qualifying time, 1 minute 30.673. Stephen Karkner in second place, about two tenths of a second back. And then L. Leroy Coppage on the out inside of row number two. John Morgan on the outside of that second row. Got ourselves a nice stack field here today as we'll just run through that grid on your screen. Let's bring in David Haynes and David. This race today, two races, of course, 18 laps, which is a very technical track in these ProMaster cars. Yeah, exactly. A couple hairpins out there, a couple of fast corners where they get to use the slicks and aerodynamics. And it's going to be very interesting because we've got the defending champion on pole, but this season's points leader, fifth on the grid. So uh, this is going to be an interesting race as we're at about the halfway point of the 60 plus racing adventures championship. Yeah, as there are your 34 drivers. Just cycle through your grid there. You see the pace car bringing the drivers on that formation lap right now as they head themselves into Tarzan box, Tarzan corner. And here is a look at the championship standings heading in to our double header tonight. Jos van der Ven then 140 points, five point advantage then, David over Stephen Karkner. Yeah, exactly. And the way the race format works in this series, we've got two races and the drivers will carry forward the points of their best race result. So for the first race, these guys really want to get a good result in the bag because they can still improve on it in the second race. If they, uh, if they have problems in race one, then race two, the pressure is going to be on. It's what I like to call the banker lap, really qualifying day but same thing applies just over an 18 lap race instead yeah exactly and it's a great format i think for the 60 plus racing adventures because it gives all of these guys uh, something to race for and a great opportunity to you know not only give us more racing to watch but they can really uh, give it a go in the second race and a little bit of wheel to wheel contact a little bit of an issue won't be round ending because there's a do over yeah and those of you who are new to the series it is worth noting that these drivers will have two fast repairs there is also an incident limit of 17 for each of the races before we get ourselves to the green flag here worth noting that the first 24 hour event well, the iRacing special event calendar is this weekend. It is that music. It is a 24 hours of Daytona. David, it's a day, night, night into day, 24 hours of Daytona. Finally, it's here. Yes, possibly one of the most anticipated features of a very long time for iRacing. And finally, we have it and we've got the first 
iRacing 24 hour special event since day night transitions and they're going to be beautiful and they're not only going to be visually nice to look at for us in the broadcast booth and for the drivers out there but it's also going to have a big effect on track temperatures through the race as the sun sets and then rises again. Track temperatures can swing massively and will put a real test on the setups and the drivers. Yeah, we're an all-star commentary team for that one. Jake Sparry for the first six hours. Along maybe with David, we're gonna try and get him, you know, we'll pay him in pizza or something. We'll talk about that one in the little in-between bit. We've got ourselves Paul Smith, Lorenzo Bonda, Gary Weaver, myself for the breakfast duties with Conry Maddock. And it is gonna be a fantastic 24-hour race. But as the drivers set themselves now through the Audi S, let's focus on the race we have in hand right about now. Because drivers are almost ready to go racing. One more major corner it is the Araline Knight corner, of course, named after the driver who won the Indianapolis 500. It's the reason why it's also named after him. It's the fastest corner on the racetrack. Let's get ourselves ready then for two races here on Racewatt TV in the 60 plus racing adventures. That pace car gonna make itself a little right hand turn on towards pit road then we'll put the field in the command of the drivers what is going to happen as the drivers accelerate down towards tarzan marks we're about to find out because the green flag is out we are racing as the cars will storm themselves in towards turn number one good news is very clean at the front of your field we've got ourselves two wide three wide in the middle of your pack for the first time but david Nice clean start, but it all gets tight here as they funnel into one of those hairpins. Yep, great job from Stefan Roestgen. He really went early. That's good for him, good for spreading the field out, but the track really does concertina them up later through Tarzan Box there and some of the hairpins we've got. Looks like pretty clean start from all of the drivers, though. Yeah, uh, as so we've got a little bit of side-by-side -side going on down in the middle part of your field right now. In fact, that's actually towards the rear of your field. We've had two wide racing as Mark Elisa and Kenneth Baldwin going at it. As uh, just further forward, let's go to that gap out front because the good thing for Rosegan by going early, he's got himself an advantage. Already eight seconds of a second over Stephen Karkner as they work down into the Audi S for the first time. It's that right-hander. The right hand is really important. You nail that, you then get the nice inside line for the second part of the S, then you go. Use that curve on the outside of the third part and then just wheel it through towards Harry Lyon Dyke corner. Lap number one is going to be in the books. Uh, there's, there's a couple of battles that might develop down this straightaway. Let's go on board here, David, and let's go on board with Bill Lawrence in the number 17 car as they work towards one. Yeah, exactly. The draft is pretty strong of an effect in these racing cars. You can really pick up some extra speed following close underneath the rear wing of the car in front. Not enough for Bill Lawrence to make a move this lap, but definitely uh, there can be a little bit of a draft lock effect sometimes. A quicker driver can find it difficult to break away and shake the tailing car because of how powerful the slipstream can be. Yeah, it's one of those things that you see quite often in all forms of motorsports, especially in these open wheel cars where you've got those huge wings on the front and the rear which is designed on one hand to provide maximum downforce but as soon as you get into dirty air can make it really hard to follow another car closely one thing for those people who's new to the 60 plus racing adventure series of course all these drivers they, they are in a fixed setup so the variables of being able to develop a setup that would work to your advantage do not come into play in this series and that's good for some drivers it can be harder for others to adapt, especially if they've got a very specific driving style. Yeah, it does provide a level playing field. It does uh, save some of the drivers who don't have maybe the time or the expertise to develop a quick setup. And I think uh, that's a great thing for this series where it, it really just makes it more accessible to a lot of the drivers. And we see that, that we've got a big grid of more than 30 drivers here. And uh, it looks like all of them still out there circulating. Yeah, as Mark Robertson were on board with him as he comes past the start finish time. We have got one driver at the very rear of your field. There we are. 
turn our attention over to him. That is Ralph Kemmerer then. This is into the Audi S. It looks as though he might have had himself a bit of an incident. Let's try and roll the tape back and see what we've got here. This is in towards the Audi S. Yeah, the back end of that car just stepping out. Had to sit there and wait for a while, David, to allow all other traffic to go past. And of course, he was also pointing in the wrong direction on the grass. Had to find a way of getting that car turned around. Exactly. Pretty respectful there because in some other series, uh, unsafe rejoins of the track can cause some big incidents. But thankfully, didn't see anything like that there. But unfortunate for Ralph Kemmerer, who now finds himself in last place. Well, we've got the gap extended from P1 to P2 up to 1.6 seconds. What we have, however, got is a battle going on for second place on track. L. Leroy Coppage has pulled out a 3.7 second advantage over the fourth place driver of John Morgan. And what he's doing right now is hounding the driver of Stephen Carkner as they come into Airline Night Corner. You can still see as we're on board with Coppage the fact the top three are all within one shot. But Coppage will want to get past now, and it might be a big move in the next couple of laps into Tarzan in order to then try and go for the race lead. Yeah, and look at this. Karkner moves over to the right-hand side of the front straight, potentially trying to break the draft to El Leroy Coppage. Doesn't work because he follows him along, but hasn't quite gotten close enough along the front straight this time. But he's still there in the mirrors of Stephen Karkner. That's a work himself into that inside section of the main track. We can hold to bottom, of course. It's a corner down at turn number three. Basically, if you if you see a corner name, it's called Bot in the national language, well, the Dutch, of course, in the Netherlands. Um, so that makes the corner lane slightly easier to understand. As we now go on board with Donald and Fruta, um, sorry, Daniel Fitterer, as he is in seventh place. He's got himself Mark Robertson just ahead, and that was a half move then as they came down into Masters Corner. That is turn number seven on track, but this is a part of the racetrack where it can be very difficult to overtake, David. You can see a lot of half moves down to seven. Not all of them will succeed. Yeah, Mark Robertson looks like he's setting that car up for a late apex through some of these corners. I think the following car uh, thought he was maybe leaving the inside open, tried to stick a nose in, had to sort of back out of it. But Mark Robertson's a little bit of a cork in the bottle right here because Donald Fitterer, Bill Lawrence and Danny Hinchin are all right behind him. And it'll be really interesting to see if anyone can make a move as they come down the pit straight this time. Yeah, indeed so. So, of course, drivers have got to make themselves a pit stop. And actually, I believe that is Mark Robertson on towards pit road. This is early, lap number 5 of 18. This is the early part of that 14 Morgan, that number 43 car coming on towards pit road then. So pit stops are already underway. And the, the purpose here for Robertson is to try and get himself clean air more than anything else at this stage of the event, David. Yeah, I think that's the strategy he's thinking of. Definitely don't see any damage on the car. Pretty quick stop, 10 seconds stationary. And it's a wide, wide pit window as he's going to rejoin with a little bit of traffic. No, he, he slows down. He'll join the back of that train because the fixed setup means they start with a small amount of fuel. The fuel tank size is not so limited. They can pit rather early and still have room to put the fuel in to make it to the end. And that's one of the good things about this series. Is of course, it means there's a very big amount of strategy that can come into play as we go back on board then with El Leroy Coppage as he heads into the Audi S once again, S box if you want to call it that. And uh, now, Kumo Kwan, this is turn number 11. It's actually only the final corner, which is our line right corner. But many people classify it as one as the same, um, unless of course you are Kumo Box originator, shall we say. Does Coppage come in? No, your top three drivers, they are going to stay out. We have a look back to 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th. We've got one driver coming on towards pit road then at the conclusion of this one. And this is Jack Turner. And one thing we just noticed there is you came on board. It's a little bit late, David. But actually coming on to pit road at this track is a little bit complicated. 
Yes, yeah, certainly. There's a little bit of a king, little bit of a chicane in the pit entry, it's designed to make you slow down, and it's enforced by some armco barriers. And you're not far off the racing surface before the enforced pit lane limit starts. So you've got to get on the brakes hard and early for that pit entry. Otherwise, you'll either be in the barrier or copping a pit lane speeding penalty, which will set you back 15 seconds. 10.3 second pit stop there for Jack Turner. Out and away he will go. Your top five has spread themselves out a little bit. Actually, this fourth and fifth place we want to turn our attention to, as this is Josh Van der Venna right now. Hasn't, of course, made a pit stop in the number 167 car, but as they work themselves now through what used to be called Vodafone Corner, turn at number nine on track, heading towards the Audi S. Van der Venna got very close through turn number seven, Masters Corner, um, but again, just couldn't find a way past. Yeah, sort of uh, shallowed his entry to the corner, didn't carry much speed through it. And carrying speed through the corners is very, very important to setting a fast lap, being quick in these cars that have, you know, 200 and some horsepower, but a lot of downforce, a lot of grip, a lot of capability to carry speed through the middle of the corner. Yeah, so, our start finish line again, we've got one more taker on towards pit road this time by. This is the driver of Bob Kern coming on towards pit road to make his pit stop. In towards the lane he comes as well. David, talk us through it. Well, he's gonna try and find his box. My eyes weren't quite on it uh, right uh, as you mentioned that. Yeah, out and away though, he does come. And that is uh, pit stop time. Actually, no, he's still in the pit box. It's 11-12, a long pit stop there for Bob Kern. So actually, it looks as though maybe he was one of those who to speed on towards Pit Road. Yep, that looks right because it's 23.6 seconds stationary, which is going on 15 seconds longer than the other pit stops just for fuel that we've seen. So certainly possible to have picked up a pit lane speeding penalty. I'm looking back, no, a tyre change for Bob Kern. Ah. I think most people are taking only fuel in this race. Pretty sturdy construction of tyres that they have on this uh, Pro Mazda car. I think Bob Kern has made a little bit of a mistake in unnecessarily also taking a tyre change, Will. Yeah, we often see this in things like the 2K World Cup occasionally drivers forgot to sell their pit crew. Actually, I don't want tyres, I want fuel only, because fuel only Lightning McQueen strategy. Yeah, and also it's worth noting that, you know, 18 laps around this track ain't really gonna harm these tyres. No, exactly. They're, uh, they're not an especially soft compound. This is a, a sort of a junior formula of car. For that kind of competition, cost control is a little bit more important than outright pace being able to pull an extra half a second per lap. So a, a sturdier construction of tyres, a harder compound that lasts longer, is typical for this kind of car, and that's what's fitted to this Pro Mazda. They can definitely handle 18 laps with not too much pace drop-off. What we just saw, by the way, was the driver of John Morgan just defending an attack from uh, Donald uh, in the number 177 machine. So that's John Morgan and the Team Otto 177. Donald uh, Fitterer in the Treble 1 Team Old Speed car. He's having another look, actually. These two drivers getting mighty close, and Jos van der Ven pushes wide. I think he was just there watching the action. Jos van der Ven was about to say, a drop back into the sixth position with David. He's now actually dropped further back into ninth. Yeah, and he is your championship points leader at this moment in time. We've seen in previous races from him, he can be very, very quick, but maybe not as consistent as some of the other drivers out there. And sort of showing now, he's just got distracted, maybe put off by uh, Donald Fitter and John Morgan nearly making contact. He's gone very, very deep and missed his breaking mar point by a significant margin. Let's go back to live footage, shall we? As we've got Gus van der Ven actually coming on towards pit road. There's a trackometer to show you hitting that speed limit. Um, coming on towards pit road for your van der Ven. So he's kind of given up. He's come on towards pit road to get some fresh fuel. We've also got ourselves more drivers on pit road. Three drivers at the moment, Jos van der Ven, Kenneth Dunner, um, and also Bob Cohen, all making services at the same time. But we haven't really talked about this driver. He's leading, Devin Roskin. He's actually got some lap traffic now ahead of him, but he has got a 3.1 second advantage 
over Stephen Karkner in the second place. Yeah, he's done a fantastic job on pulling that gap, and that's great because that's what he needs if he's going to defend his title uh, this season. Some great results in the back half of the season. Stefan Rostjen is putting on a good display right now. We haven't seen too many mistakes from him, just quick and absolutely within the limit of the car. Yeah, we just saw John Morgan then losing the fourth place. Let's have ourselves one more look at this summer aerial coverage brought to you by And One Design. Down to the inside goes the treble one machine. And just before you know it, you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, the old speed treble one car up into fourth place. Morgan in the one treble seven, so one double seven car. Team Otto down into the fifth place. No one from your top five is coming in, but we've got drivers in the seventh position that is Danny Hinchling coming on towards Pit Road then. We are past the halfway point. Number 33 car on towards Pit Road. We've also got ourselves Steve Isaacs on towards Pit Road in the number 88 machine as well. Yeah, so just past the halfway point of the number of laps, as good a time as any to come in and get that fuel. So let's go back to El Leroy Coppage. And actually what has happened in the last couple of laps, David, he's kind of fallen back to the rear. Oh, Stephen Karkner to about one second back. And this is what you talked about earlier. Following another car can actually be pretty hard in this type of car because they are downforce cars. They are not designed to work very well when they are right behind another driver, lap after lap after lap. And speaking of that downforce, I'm not sure how you or our viewers see it, but from my perspective, a bit of damage on the front wing of El Leroy Coppage. I'm not sure he's hit another car. What he may well have done is clobbered a big curb very aggressively. And what that will do is it'll not only hurt his front downforce, hurt his speed, but in a straight line, that'll also be not making very efficient downforce at all, be hurting his fuel consumption, hurting his straight line speed as he dodges uh, someone who was around Jared Falorison having a couple of issues as well. Yeah, although the second place driver has come on towards pit road. That is the driver of Stephen Karkner then in the number 75 machine has been in second place for the majority of this event, but now is on towards pit road and david this this pit stop time really needs to be in the low 10 second bracket of course so by taking less fuel this could be closer to eight he actually almost stalls the car coming up pit road 10.3 out and away yeah that's a pretty standard pit stop time if he went a bit longer than that he might find himself in trouble dropping back into that draft that he worked so hard to shake and from a car that might have saved a tiny bit of fuel, might have a quicker pit stop. Well, interesting to see if anyone who's used the draft efficiently through this race and is staying out can maybe try and undercut some other cars by a second or two. John Morgan came out of pit road and almost went right into the side of Kenneth Dunham. I want to show this one to you again as he comes out of pit road. So let's just turn our attention a little bit to the left on a 360 cam. Actually, I'll take that back. When he comes in towards turn one, it doesn't look that bad at all. Just in the overhead shot, it looked closer than it actually did. So we'll take that one back. It is still Stephen Riskin who is leading the way, not on towards pit road. Coppage in second place, not coming on towards pit road at this time. So a number of drivers are leaving it very late in the day to come on towards pit road. It is Donald of Fritzen now. Um, he is coming past start finish line, but we've got more drivers on towards pit road. This one is Bill Lawrence right now, and this is in the Team Morgan car on towards pit road in the number 17. We'll keep you updated on what he's going to do in terms of lap times. I'm trying to see if there's any real battles going on, on track. The field has kind of like separated itself out as the drivers have started to make their pit stops, David. In fact, the best one we've got going on right now is all the way outside of your top 20 by two drivers who are pitted. They're also team teammate, Bob Kern and Kenneth Dummer. Yep, the number seven and the number six cars. So that's an interesting one going on there. As you mentioned, both have pitted. It was a rather long pit stop for Bob Kern though. So he might be the slightly quicker driver and just being buried deeper in the pack by nature of taking a long pit stop. 
Yeah, and there's also actually Kenneth Baldwin in number seven machine there as well. So two Kenneths in a Bob sandwich, or the other way around, depending on how you want to classify it. Um, we might get some Bob's Burgers on the way as well. Richard um, Kong then in the number 68 car. Um, he has not pitted in that Team Auto number 68 car. He's behind Jack Turner by six times of a second. We don't really expect to see much of a battle, but what we have got is second place on towards pit road. Yeah, this is going to be absolutely critical for El Leroy Coppage. He needs a quick stop if he's going to stay up there with the likes of Stephen Karkner. It is a critical, critical phase of the race for El Leroy Coppage. Pit time. It's a long pit stop. Up to 15 seconds then. For, and this is exactly what he did not want. I don't think he's getting tires, or is he? 23 seconds. I don't see the car on the jacks. No, he's not. So the speeding penalty, 27, 28. What's gone wrong for Coppage? He's over 30 seconds now. Disaster for him. The driver looking to try and get a second place. He's stuck on pit road, and he's still going nowhere. Yeah, it, even if it was a pit lane speeding penalty and tyres and fuel, he'd be out by now. This is rapidly approaching a minute and rapidly approaching a nightmare for El Lero Coppage, who gets going after, have a look at that, nearly 53 seconds stationary on the lane. That has dropped him a long way down the order and most definitely out of a podium position. Two drivers haven't pitted. They are your top two. Well, the first one of those is in. Stephen Rosgen then coming on towards pit road to make that one mandatory pit stop required in this series. What about the treble one machine? Is he going to come on towards pit road as well? Yes, indeed so. So the team old speed car with Donald Fitzroy coming on towards pit road as well. Taking a bit more then through the chicane actually. Fitzroy in the treble one machine. Well, let's go back and turn our attention over first of all to the 10. Out and away, pit stop time, nice for him. 8.4 seconds by going this late into the event, you can risk taking less fuel because you know exactly how many laps you've got to do to get to the end, David. Yeah, exactly. You've got a little bit more certainty, and Stefan Roskin has all race long uh, been by himself with the assistance of uh, no draft and not too much traffic. So his per lap fuel consumption will have remained very consistent. He'll have a good idea, and his pit crew will know how much he needs to get to the end and he's rejoined the lead rather comfortably, four seconds clear of Stephen Karkner. Well, earlier on, we saw Jos van der Ven having a mare of a time going um, wide down at, we call it Masters Corner, Mulber Corner, I think it's 60 plus, let's call it Mulber Corner, give it a historic name. But Jos van der Ven looking to the inside right now, and he's up into third position. That was a fantastic move by him, and a fantastic run after he fell down to the rear end of your top 10 for Van der Van. Yeah, I think pitting earlier than the pack he was in was a great move for Jos because it's taken him out of the traffic that was distracting him, let him just punch in a couple of quick laps that we know he can do, that he knows he can do. And now he's leading this little train, but he will assuredly get the chance to demonstrate his pace and he might be able to pull clear because that was a great move he just pulled on Donald Federer. Yeah, fantastic. And actually, it's kind of all bunched up now behind him as well. You've got to keep an eye out on the driver of the number 33 machine. That is Danny Hinchin from Club UK and Ireland here in this Pro Mazda. And of course, let's not forget, we've got one more race to go. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that these drivers will take the best result from the outing, from this evening. As we see Jos van der Ven going defensive into Tarzan Corner. We actually also see Ninchin going a little bit defensive into Tarzan Corner as well. We'll go on board with Bill Lawrence in the Team Morgan number 17 machine. And because of the fact they'll take their best finish, in some cases, David, this is when you still want to think about getting the banker. Yeah, exactly. And one of the interesting things is you might think, OK, if you win the first race, there's no point in showing up to the second one. But if you win the first race, you can go ahead and win the second race. And by winning it, uh, deny your other competitors the chance of taking those points. So there's still incentive to rock up for both. Yeah, so just saw my timing and score on the screen. There is another battle going on behind 
This has got Manny, Manning, Grinnell in the number, sorry, I'm not quite sure if we're focusing on, we're not yet, no, there we are now. It's a number 47 machine of Manning, Grinnell, and the number 177 of John Morgan. They were going side by side a moment ago. Uh, Morgan did a 10.3 second pitch stop, Manning did himself an 11 second pitch stop, and really wishes he had those over seven tenths of a second in the bank right now as they come through the Audi S. But on board the team Old Speed Driver as they'll come towards Kumo Corner. And they've only got a couple of laps to go. Even Rodgkin's actually got himself, by well, I'm looking at about two and two thirds laps to go. We're on board of him for a moment as he works himself up the hill. And this is actually, I, I tell you what, I've done this so many times on a 360 simulator. It's a breathtaking experience to do so in a car like a pro mask like this because it's flat out. Then realistically, when you come into that part of the racetrack, that right hander, it's just a lift off the throttle as we now actually are going to go on board with Bill Lawrence because he's closed it right up as they work themselves up the hill. And it's this right hander in a moment that I'm talking about being one of my favorite corners in all of motorsport, David because it's so hard, on it's a corner, it's called, actually. You know, you've got a feather to throttle through there, and it's a brave man to try and overtake. We've seen a couple of occasions of that happening, however. Yeah, exactly. I think Jos van der Ven is that brave man. And it, you rightly mentioned a very interesting corner. In a car like this, it's nearing flat out. In something like a Porsche 911 Cup car, something we'll be seeing a lot more of in the future. It's nearly a brake and a downshift. So it's really a corner that gives you an idea of how a racing car works, how much grip it's got, and how uh, difficult it might be to drive. Yeah, now the pit stops have concluded. Let's just give you up today with your movers and shakers in this event. And what you see, a number of people's moved up at least three or more places. Your biggest mover inside your top 15, that is Bruce Paul. He is up eight places here today. Your top two drivers are as they stand. Of course, and everyone back has moved up at least one because of L. Leroy Coppage's long pit stop. And I would really like to have a word of him to figure out what the issue was at some point either after this race or at the end of our webcast. But we have still got a battle going on, of course, with Donald Fritter in the old speed racing car. He's got Jos van der Ven ahead. He's been passed recently. He's also got, so got Danny Hinchin, who's only four tenths of a second back. Two laps to go here. Do you make the moves in the Audi S this time, or do you wait until Tars on the final lap? Yeah, well, it, there's a potential if you do it on the last lap, you might get passed back. Uh, I'm not sure what you'd want to do or what these drivers are thinking of, but certainly you want to do it in a place that you're going to make it stick. So it's a it's a tough decision to be made and with how strong the draft can be in these cars. There's plenty to think about, which isn't easy uh, while you're sitting in the cockpit of the race car doing the high speeds. Yeah, just got ourselves one more lap to go at the line, but it is still this person who leads it as we take the white flag here at Circuit Park Zandvoort for the first of our two races here today. It is Stefan Rodzgen who is leading by about 3.3 seconds. That is a visual look at the gap and it is gonna be a long way back before we can turn our attention over to Jos van der Ven who is in that third place. But van der Ven himself is holding on for this podium because he's got Donald Fitterer who's only a couple of tenths of a second back, David. Yeah, precisely. Uh, Jos van der Ven cannot rest until he's passed that finish line and he sees the chequered flag waved. It, doing this, though, he's pulled Donald Fitterer a little bit away from that battle that's forming between Danny Hinch and Bill Lawrence. So that's another one to watch. We've got two fantastic battles for the price of one here. Yeah, also, Jack Turner. want to go on board of him. He's just had a mare of a corner. This is down into Hogan Hook's box um, as well. He got turned around and he's dropped down to the 10th place there on the last lap. He's been passed by one of his own teammates. So that's an update on Jack Turner. We'll give you more if we can after this race is scored complete. Only a couple of moments now left to go in this amount of race. The drivers head themselves down to the Audi S. Realistically, your last passing opportunity on the racetrack, but it is going to be the driver of Steven Roskin, who's going to be your winner 
in the first of our two races here today. Ruskin is going to be your race victor, but we're going to turn our attention back to third, fourth, and fifth place on track. It looks as though that Jos van der Ven will just about be able to hold on to a podium. You can see he's doing the wiggles. He's happy. Jos van der Ven, third place. Stephen Karkner in second. Stefan Rosgen gets the win for the first of our two races. A couple of close battles out the line. Danny Hinchkin and Bill Lawrence separated by only a tenth of a second. Um, Manning, um, Grimnen, so Manning Grinnan um, about a tenth of a second back from John Morgan at the end. We saw those two dropping positions. Well, entertaining last couple of laps there, David. Yeah, no doubt. Start to finish was actually pretty entertaining. A little bit of fuel strategy, plenty of battling out there, some great moves. And I think uh, Sean Morgan did manage to defend that eighth position. So plenty to talk about. And the great thing is we get to do it all again in not too long. And some of these drivers have redemption on their mind. I'm thinking about L. Lee Roy Coppage, for example. And some drivers like Stefan Rostrand just need to defend their win to stop anyone else from taking those precious points. Well, let's get a look then at your top 10 in the results. And, well, it was an easy win. Many would argue then for the driver of... Sorry, I'm trying to look at I'm looking at of oh, the driver, Stefan Roskin, winning by 3.7 seconds when all was said and done over Stephen Karkner. And um, third place, Joss Van der Ven, but almost 20 seconds back from your leading duo. Donald Fitterer in fourth place. Danny Hinchin, fifth. Bill Lawrence, John Unsby, John Morgan, Anning Gunn, Grinnan, and Jack Turner rounds out your top 10. So, nice range of clubs. We've got Club Diaz, Club Canada, Benelux, New York, Club UK, and Ireland. And a load of the American clubs all involved in that one. Some of you are going to be asking, yep, yeah, but what about their team involvement? That's there for you right now. Team Old Speed, they get themselves a fourth place and a ninth place. Team Otto, an eighth place. Team Morgan, a sixth place finish. Let's go on to the second page of our results. And Bruce Paul, 11th place. Franz Brick in 12th. Paul A. Preto, 13th. Joel Martin in 14th. Get a Baldwin rounds out your top 15. The rest of the results coming up on your screen. Well, David, one down, one to go. If you're the driver of Stefan Ruskin, you're right. Get the win again. Take some points away from those people around you. There's going to be a lot of drivers. who's now got more time in the car. Knows how the track's behaving. He's going to look for something very different in race two. Yeah, exactly. It also gives some of these drivers a good idea about their race fuel consumption. We might see some of them try to cut the fuel a little bit skinnier in the second race. Certainly a great scouting race, uh, even if they didn't get the result they wanted in race one. They can take what they've learned here and apply it to race two. Well, we have got ourselves a chance to have a couple of interviews. as We just put the last part of the results up on your screen. And I believe, David, that you have got the driver of Stefan Rosgen, who came home in the first place here today. Yeah, Stefan, great race, led just about every lap. Fuel strategy looked perfect. Can you back it up in race two to maybe try and take this championship again? I'll try it. Um, let's see what happens. You, you never know. Sometimes some roadblocks are occurring on the, on the track was in in this race two times and sometimes you lose concentration so i hope for the best and your thoughts on circuit park zandvoort a pretty historic track lots of different series have raced here are you finding it challenging or, or is it very familiar to you in, in the past i found it very challenging once you have learned the critical passages then it then it works but, but there are still some two corners which are really, really uh, tough. That is uh, the chicane and um, uh, the, uh, the last right-hander before, before we go to the straight line. And the slipstream is always pretty strong in these cars. Uh, once you broke that draft, you were kind of away. But is it guaranteed that you'd be able to do that in race two? I really don't know. This is this depends on uh, if, if if the guys behind me are fighting themselves or work together. When I when I was in the in the normal Pro Master race last week, 
I wasn't able to race away any time. Well, congratulations on picking up that win in race one. Good luck in race two. And while we've got you, any shout outs, any thanks? Yeah, thanks to the organizers and the race for to be as well. Good job. Awesome. Well, there we go, Will. Well, thank you. I've got a second place driver, Stephen Karkner, coming home um, about 3.7 seconds back. And actually, Stephen, I would suggest that was a bit of a boring race for you here today. Uh, it wasn't boring. I was following Stefan quite well for a while there, and uh, he just kept slipping away half a second at a time. So I decided to pit a little bit earlier and uh, see if I could catch him in the pit, but that didn't happen either. Of course, by pitting early, you did get the opportunity to really solidify that second place. You ended up actually 15 seconds ahead of third place on the trading pack. Did you actually expect to have that big of an advantage over the rest of the field? No, I was assuming that something happened behind us to get that big of a lead. Uh, I know Josh was working his way through a couple of people there and then trying to catch up to us. Second race, of course, coming up. Um, we talked about the start a moment ago with um, Stephen, um, Stephen even. In, in terms of this second race, how important is it for the outside line and the drivers in second, third and fourth to really put pressure on whoever gets pole position in that second race in the opening laps? Yeah, with the tires a little cold, it's a little dicey in that first corner to be too aggressive. But yeah, you can make it around on the outside. Hopefully next race I'm going to qualify first and then I don't have to worry about them. Well, before you let you go, shout out sponsors. Who gets it done? Uh, shout out to 60 plus racers. There's a lot of us here, the organizers and my family for letting me do this every Wednesday. Well, thank you very much then to Steve Karkner coming home second place. Jos van der Ven, David, seemed very happy in terms of his body language as he came past the start of finish line and he stood by with you. Yeah, well, Jos, trying to uh, maintain that championship lead, third place is a pretty good result in race one, but you really did have to work hard for it. Um, indeed, I had to work hard. I started uh, fifth position and I got involved in, uh, in a battle. It's hard to overtake uh, here on this track, at least for me. And uh, I decided to pit early and I think uh, that was a good decision because uh, at that time before I pitted I was in seventh or eighth position and I finished third, so I'm very happy with that. Yeah, it can really go either way. The early pit stop could bury you uh, in the field or could give you some clean air to maybe make an undercut. And it has worked out for you. But do you think you can go one, maybe two positions better in race two? Um, to be honest, no. Stefan and Steve are way too fast for me on this track. This would almost be a little bit of a home track for you, though. What are your feelings about Circuit Park Zandvoort? Do you find it frustrating or find it uh, enjoyable? Well, at least my race was enjoyable because uh, I had to fight for my position. Um, but um, I've never been to Zandvoort in, in real life, so um, I don't really know this track. And apparently I didn't uh, practice enough this week, so... Well, hopefully you can take what you've learned in race one and put on another great show in race two. Well, we've got you here on the broadcast. Uh, anyone you need to thank? Yeah, I've, of course I want to thank uh, the guys who organize this every week and you for the broadcast and my family at home for letting me do this. Awesome. Thanks so much for having a word with us, and maybe we'll see you after race two if you find yourself on the podium again. Good luck in that one, and uh, over to you, Will. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Of course, whilst we have got ourselves a little bit of a break, let's cue the music one more time. You 
know what, David? Every time, every year, and I'm just going to let you hear it as well for the first time this year. Every time I hear this music, I know the 24 hours of Daytona is inching closer. It's one of my most fun broadcasts of the year to commentate. It's not always gone to plan. Um, sometimes we end up reading Cracker Barrel menus and not actually having anything to talk about. But the 24 hours of Daytona, day into night, through the dusk, into the sunrise, it is really for us, I think, a kind of reset. The end of 2018 really starts this week because we get ourselves a new load of drivers, a new load of teams coming to center stage in our special event. And my word, am I looking for Yeah, exactly. I think we've also... I think the Porsche 911 RSR might be new from last year. I think it's making its Daytona debut as well. And it makes a delicious, delicious noise racing around the banking with that screaming naturally at, at, at the naturally aspirated. I got the word uh, flat six. Yeah, we get there in the end. And of course, as well as our stream on RaceWat TV, exclusively live on the Iris and Esports Network. It is, of course, not a 24 hours at Daytona unless we mention the Flash broadcast. David? You know what I mean. 24 hours, one drive. I mean, is this his fourth year doing it now? Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know because uh, I'm typically racing racing it, not f yeah. following along quite as closely as I know you like to do. Yeah, I, I think it's his fourth year, racing some fantastic money in terms of Extra Life. Extra Life in itself, a really good cause of getting um, sim racers, gamers, casters, commentators, all involved in raising money for fantastic courses. I know the Plash broadcast is back and of course, You'll, we'll, we'll be talking about it during the 24 hours of Daytona broadcast itself. So don't worry, we will make sure you get the links for that one. David, you say that you're racing in it again. Talk us through your preparations for this weekend. Uh, lots of disagreements about uh, anti-roll bars. Yeah. And of course, it is a track, realistically, of two halves, because you have got that infield section where you know you can lose two seconds if you set the car up the wrong way. But then you've got basically 90% of the banking that you're going to be running. Yes, you've got to slow down, put a bus stop chicane. But actually, when you're tired, when it's dark, when you've been running for five hours, that bus stop chicane is a thing that will come and bite you on the backside. Oh, yes, precisely. It's one of the more dangerous parts on the track. And especially if you're closing up on another car and maybe you have to narrow your entry to it, you're going side by side with a different class of car. Very, very sketchy. I think a lot of what our uh, little slight disagreements are revolving around is someone will say, I really like the feel of this setup. And someone else will say, yeah, it's good during the day, but during the night, it's not going to be good. Or that will work during the night, but then once the sun comes up, the track will be too hot and slippy. That setup's going to be a death trap. So that's one of the things that day night is giving us is you've got to really think hard about your setup for something that's going to work over the full 24 hours over the huge uh swings in track temperature we might see i'm expecting we might see anything like between 18 degrees celsius and 40 degrees celsius for a track temperature and that's a huge difference in all of these classes of cars for how they handle and how you set them up compromising the setup and also compromise and more work for crew chiefs, actually. And this is going to be the key thing for this year. The big teams are going to have to think about tyre pressures as one big component, David. How do you change the setup of the car to adjust to the nighttime conditions, to adjust to the slippier daytime conditions? How do you do that when realistically all you've got is tyre pressures to work with? Yeah, exactly. And that's why there's, a, there's teams cleverer than me and cleverer than us because i can't tell you yeah what we are going to do at this stage ladies and gentlemen we are going to take ourselves a short break here on our webcast of the 60 plus racing adventures here on race what tv we're going to get ourselves ready for race number two don't go anywhere we'll be back in about five to ten minutes
fist to the front bumper, and he hits him again now. Ray Alfala into the outside wall. Weber is going to pass nearly three cars down that front straightaway, and he's going to get them all done with him. What a amazing... Race lead to the inside goes Logan Cloudman is going to touch in. Hip press. He saves it. What a save. Looks to the outside, and Trunke goes off. De Jong into second place. I'm going for the switchback. Oh, ho, ho. Pinpoint driving. It's howling oh. down to the inside. Oh. I try this contact, though. Slide left to the race track. Chris Venner drive it back down underneath, and he takes that second spot right back. Joker and goes to Garrett Lowe. Garrett Lowe should take victory with all that contact. He's going to try and make the move around the upset the Parabolka. That's not going to work, but he's going to try and get the cut back here. Get the run out the Parabolka. That's beautifully done there. Michael Schumann, there's a little bit of door banging as well. Growing up as a kid in Oklahoma, where I'm from, the Chili Bowl is the biggest race that we have. The Chili Bowl has kind of been my favorite race of the year. Growing up a dirt racer in Oklahoma, that's kind of the Holy Grail.
So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made up. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more kilometers. Oh, there we go! Right. They tried! This time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Cronky! Sam inside and throws the block and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. Hand over my heart. I do this for my town. I do this for my crown. So turn me up real loud. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Turning the track up. I'm never going back down. Hand over my heart. Growing up as a kid in Oklahoma, where I'm from, the Chili Bowl is the biggest race that we have. The Chili Bowl has kind of been my favorite race of the year. Growing up a dirt racer in Oklahoma, that's kind of the Holy Grail. On the 60 plus racing adventures from Circuit Park Zandvoort. Qualifying is underway for the second of our two events this evening. 
Wilmington along with David Haynes. Let's take a quick moment to say thank you to the following people. Apparently, David, you've been doing camera work all night. Thanks, Hugo. Yeah, uh, unfortunately not the case. So, <laughs> well done, Will, because uh, you're, you're on top of it. And I'm just the pretty face. Yeah, uh, so what we're just going to do for the moment is we are going to go ahead and just scratch that one out. Uh, but thank you to Ismail Balao, trackcams22.com, Andres Werner and One Design for our overlay design development by Simon Grossman and AppGeneering.com. And as ever, Nick Thiersen for Racebot TV. Live timing and scoring track conditions, David. 20 degrees Celsius, partially cloudy, two kilometer an hour winds, two laps, qualifying for race number two. But the sun is out, so the track temperature is a rather warm 38 degrees Celsius. That'll be taking away some of the grip from the drivers, making the cars a little bit more oversteery. Let's uh, see how that challenges some of our drivers. Yeah, I want to turn my attention over to this man, L. Leroy Coppage. reason why I want to turn my attention to him, David, was because he had a mare in race number one. It was all going so well, running in a podium position, but then he had a very long pit time. That was not what he wanted. Yep, precisely. So whatever happened then, and I, I can't say for sure, but I'm sure we'll be trying to avoid that one, hopefully learning from whatever it was that necessitated such a long, uh, almost race-destroying pit stop. So sector one for him, 32.243 into what was once upon a time called Vodafone Corner. Vodafone Bot now heading towards the Audi S. Sector two is gonna come out any moment now. 31.133 for him. Through the Audi S, he will come. You'll see times as they appear on the left-hand side of your screen. But Coppage really want a top four minimum negate damage don't forget you take your best result from the meeting in towards your championship Steve Isaacs fast start finish line Devin Rogan 131.053 slower than what he did I believe in qualifying Stefan Karkner to first place Coppage into third yeah so not bad from Stefan Rogan but Stephen Karkner setting the pace right now as a couple more lap times come through yeah, Roskin second, Coppich in third, Josman de Vanden fourth, and John Unsby rounds out your top five. So what we're really seeing is the top three from race number one being joined by the driver who should have been in the top three from race number one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, plenty of opportunity for people who had a, a dodgy race one to improve on in race two, but it is those familiar names that have clearly worked out how to drive this car. And there are, there's, there's a reason that Roskin and Jos van der Ven have championship titles in this series. Uh, it's because they can keep putting in consistent and uh, up, up the pointy end lap times and races. Yeah, uh, as Clark uh, 32.0 for his first sector. 30.9 for sector number two. Karkner, fantastic run. This is going to be a mid one minute 30 by the looks of it as he comes down into Kumo Corner. Two corners to go for Stephen Karkner. He's on provisional pole position already. Will he maintain it as drivers come past the start finish line again? Well, we see some movement inside of your top 10. Karkner past the line. 130.881 faster by a tenth or so of a second. Well, that was interesting there for him. As we have just, there we are, we've got our feedback. Jos van der Ven up into third place there, David, last minute. Yeah, and no improvement from Stefan Roskin either. So it looks like, as I mean, there's still a couple of cars out there to set some lap times. That looks like that's probably what our top three is gonna be. Yep, so what we're gonna do, ladies and gentlemen, now we've got ourselves our grid sorted out pretty much for race number two. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back after this.
final drive. Once again, fun to finish here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Will it be Tim Hopkins? It's going to be Christopher DeMerry at the line. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And, well, you know, we've already talked about one of the big events coming our way in 2019. That one, of course, being the 24 Hours of Daytona. But, I mean, I just saw it. You just saw it there as well, David. It is the Dolara IR-18. That means, is it May yet? Ah, uh, yes. I mean... There's a lot going on in the real world IndyCar series as well. And so I don't think I've been as hyped for uh, for IndyCar and for the iRacing Indianapolis 500 as I am right now. There's some big names coming to the real world one. And we've got Joshua Chin who has to try and defend his iRacing Indy 500 win. And I think the competition in that one is only going to be hotter than the year before. Yep, NTT taking over the title sponsorship of the now NTT IndyCar Series, no longer the Verizon IndyCar Series. And this is also going to be the 10th annual iRacing Indy 500. There's only one other competition on iRacing that's been going on as long as Indy 500, Dave, and that is the World Cup of iRacing. Yeah, fantastic. It just goes to show, I guess, how far we have come in these years on iRacing because that IR18, it looks good, it sounds good, and it races very well, both on road courses and on uh, you know, shorter ovals and super speedways, famous ones like Indianapolis. So, a great race, and I don't want to you know, wish the year away now, but I am looking forward to May, certainly. Oh, yeah, month of May also, one of the most fascinating. May through June is, is such a special time for runner racing. But before that, we've got ourselves so much action on the iRacing Esports Network, including the 24 hours of Daytona that we talked about already. You got yourself the NIS Daytona 500. We got ourselves, of course, more racing from the 60 Plus Racing Adventure Series. Porsche World Championship Series coming your way this March. Two World Championship Series of a hundred thousand dollar prize pool that is going to be fascinating 2019 the year that iris and the world championship series really moves into the big time but as the qualifying time ticks down there are no major changes to our qualifying order so let's run through your starting grid for this race number two of 60 plus racing adventures And it is going to be the driver of Stephen Cogner starting on pole position for race number two. Stefan Ruskin alongside him on the front row of the grid. Jos van der Ven inside row two. L. Leroy Coppage on the outside of that second row. Mark Robertson for Team Morgan in fifth place. Danny Hinchim in the sixth position. Team Otto's John Morgan in seventh place. Jack Turner. In eighth spot, ninth place will go to John Unsby and Bob Coin rounds out your top ten. What are we looking for in this second race, David? 
Um, definitely a little bit more precision from some of the drivers. They know uh, more about the circuit. They know more about how this car races in the draft. They know more about their fuel consumption, about their pit strategy, about not speeding on the pit lane. I think with all of that combined, hopefully if there's less errors, we'll see some closer racing. We've got Stefan Roestgen starting from the outside. He's going to have to try and get around Stephen Karkner and run away. Otherwise, someone else is going to match his championship points from this round and he might uh, not extend or close the gap. Yep, as we got ourselves ready for race number two, let's give you a little bit of Race Watch TV fan immersion. of the Pro Masters as they head themselves right now towards the Marlborough Corner on tracks. Marlborough Box. 34 drivers, David. We didn't lose anyone from race one to race number two. However, race number two being more aggressive, it's worth noting. 17 incident points. That is all you are allowed. And certainly there's a few places around the track here. It wouldn't be hard to pick up an off track. I'm thinking about particularly around this sector where they are here. And definitely the Audi S as well. That's one where you can get too deep on the brakes, cut across the corner, and that would definitely pick you up. One incident point, no worries. Our aerial coverage today is brought to you by And One Design, the official graphics partner of Racebot TV. And there's a look at this track, you know. They make good use of space um, because from turn four, who can hogspot all the way down to the Audi S, you can see it on your screen right now. Really narrow that section of the racetrack. They've got multiple club layouts as well, David. Yeah, the uh, Netherlands not a country with a whole lot of land and half of it they made themselves. So good on them for that. Fitting in this fantastic racetrack very uh, historied with Formula One, DTM, touring cars, all sorts, but it's turned today for these pro Mazda cars for 60 plus racing adventures. Yeah, we're on board right now with Stephen Karkner. He will have pole position, the racing line in towards Tarzan Corner in just one moment time, because this is his view as we go on board of him right now, the iRacing pace car, once again, going to dart to the right-hand side on the exit of Ari Lyondike Corner. Pace car is going to do that any moment now. Here's a look from up above as that pace car will turn right. Will Karkner go or will he hold? He goes immediately. Green flag in the air as we are ready for race number two. Yep, he gets a great jump. Jos van der Ven might think about the inside of Stefan Roeskin. He's not quite close enough this time, as at least the front pack are all pretty clean through turn one. Looking further back, plenty of two wide action, but no incidents, no door banging, and no crumpled cars just yet. That is a work now for 180 degree corner. Who can hold marked? Single file for the most part as they work through here. No one into the tire barrier. It's a fantastic start 
for our second of two races here today. And of course, don't forget, you can get a social with us forward slash Racebot TV at Racebot TV on Twitter. So it's now a case of uh, your race leader, the number 75 machine. He doesn't have a gap yet. Even Rosegun is right behind him. Only a third of a second back right now. You see the flames coming out the rear. That Pro Master car under braking. Wagner has got to get in a couple of good sectors if he wants to pull away. Yeah, he got that fantastic jump off the start. That gave him half a second, plenty of space to work with. But through the slipstream heading up towards the back section of the circuit, Stefan Rosegun absolutely stayed with him. And Jos van der Ven staying with that, and El Roy Coppedge too. And they're starting to pull a little bit of a gap on fifth place Mark Robertson. So these top four cars right now are the ones looking like they could have a win. And Stephen Karkner weaves that train down the front stretch, Will. Yeah, we talked about Indy. Is it May yet? Well, in terms of the draft look, yes, it might well already be so. One drive onto pit road already. That is Jack Turner. We assume with some damage. Ross Goodnight has gone back on board of him as they come into Hogan Holt's corner once again. Taking a different line for this corner as the majority of the field remain single file. What we saw in race number one is we saw a lot of people close together but not really fighting until after pit stops. You see that often also, David, in the 2K World Cup when actually there is a role in this part of the race. It's called Fuel Economy. Yeah, exactly. And it's not something that a Mazda rotary engine is known for, but certainly can play a role in your race strategy. We saw it in race one that a lot of guys were taking 10 seconds of fuel. Stefan Roestgen took eight seconds of fuel. Didn't look like any worries for him. And if you're in a pack as tight as this one, two seconds saved on the pit lane could mean three, four or more positions. It could come very, very valuable later on. Yeah, El Leroy Coppage with running aboard of him. You can see the trackometer on the right-hand side of your screen. It's really useful, actually, to see how these drivers go up and down through the gears and how many RPMs they're taking as well. Now, on a fixed setup, you might think, well, that's the same for everyone. But some people, of course, are a little bit... And that's a lot of weaving. A lot of weaving there by Karkner. As um, Reagan really putting the pressure on, actually, maybe thinking about the outside line into Tars Lane Corner. No. Not just yet, Rosgen with the fastest lap of the event so far. One minute 30.9 that last time by. A lot of weaving, a lot of fuel saving going on, a lot of different strategies. And I say, that trackometer, it's useful to see the shift points because some people be doing kind of like auto blip, some people doing it manually. Yeah, and that first corner, a little bit banked, so Stefan Rostrin might be able to take it around the outside, but he opted not to this time. And Jos van der Ven and El Leroy Coppage still right behind him. So these top four continue to make a little bit of a breakaway from all of the battles deeper in the field. Yeah, let's not forget as well, David. Zanfor are saying they want to host a Formula 1 Grand Prix again. Um, they had themselves Charlie White and go out there in 2018. This is a track that if it was to come apart, the Formula 1 schedule again would be almost universally loved by drivers as it is a technical but driver's track. What we have got today, of course, is more club style open wheel racing as we're now on board with Bill Lawrence in the 11th place putting pressure on Manning Brennan as they come through the exit of the LDS. But this is a track that most people actually enjoy racing at. Yeah, it certainly depends on the car how much fun you have racing it, but if it found its way onto the F1 calendar, uh, you could be relatively assured right now that all of the Dutchies would definitely show up uh, in great numbers. Solid battle here, 5th through to 11th, and Manning Grinnen uh, is one of those drivers along with Bill Lawrence. Manning Grinnen currently leading the Super 70s division of this championship. Again, a little bit self-explanatory, a sub-championship within this series for drivers over the age of 70. Manning Grinnen showing that age, absolutely no barrier to sim racing, and that's why I love this series. Uh, it really shows that passion for racing and racing talent has no boundaries on age. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll get some statistics up about this a little bit later on, but one of the things I really, really love about, you know, this series is, is it proves that, you know, in the same way we talk about 
the, the young drivers, the 13 to 18 year old drivers, using motorsports as a method of doing something they wouldn't normally be able to do otherwise, the same applies at the opposite end of the spectrum. You are unlikely to be able to afford or have the opportunity to get into motorsports at a high level in your 50s, 60s and beyond. But this series shows actually, you know what, there's an opportunity for drivers to do so in a simulated environment. Yeah, precisely. And what we do see from this series rather often is uh, pretty good driving standards. Uh, they've certainly got plenty of respect for their fellow competitors. And sometimes when we watch other racing series, it'd be nice if they'd teach the youngsters some of that. And one thing also, just having a look, fastest ever race lap time as we've got side by side with Manning Quillen and Bob Cohen. Cohen going to go around the outside. And, no, that's my, actually Manning. Manning Gwen on the outside, number 47 machine, makes that position up into P number 9. Fastest ever race lap around here, the Pro Master, 128.7. They are doing 130.7 or so right now. That's two seconds slower, but that's considering that we're using really our racing standard track um, layout with an iron sing based, um, you know, a fix it up here, David. To be two seconds only slower than a world record shows the high caliber of drivers we have. Yeah, and it's quite a hot track surface. These drivers are going five tenths or so slower than they did in the previous race, in race one, where the track was about five degrees cooler. So, really, uh, your top drivers, Stephen Karkner, Stefan Roosjen, Jos van der Ven, they're not far off a very competitive pace in these cars. As Oh, it's very close. Bob Cohen, Bill Lawrence, Kenneth Baldwin there for the final spot in the top 10. Yeah, as we're on board right now with Kenneth Baldwin in the number 16 machine as he works himself through Kumo Corner. Now towards Ari Leindijk. Can you see ahead? Lawrence and Cohen going side by side already. This will give the opportunity now for Kenneth Baldwin to get a draft in either lane and close up on the run into Tarzan Corner. Lawrence and Cohen still side by side in towards Tarzan Corner and that's allowed Baldwin to come within a car length of these two. In fact, Baldwin looking as though he might try and make a move into Hugen Holt's corner and decides not to. Yeah, Lawrence gets the job done and Cohen loses uh, two positions in as many laps into that first corner, into Tarzan Bok. So unfortunately, he's dropping down the order a little bit, but he did qualify very well in the top 10. As let's have a look. Are we going to see Bolden making a move maybe into Slavic? No, not this time by as they work just behind the hill. I mean, it, you know, the Netherlands, many people call it a flat country. Parts of it are incredibly flat. But here at this track, there is some undulations that these drivers can see and experience. Most of the track is flat, but there are parts that you get to have a fantastic ride. Out front, the battle for the race lead carries on, although... Roskin just kind of overshot the Audi S there. Yeah, have a look at that one. Certainly, uh, six tenths of a second means Roskin's in the draft of Stephen Karkner, but he's not right up under his rear wing, nudging his gearbox, giving him a hard time about it. He's a, a, a clever and calculated competitor, so he might be pushing hard right now, but he could also just be saving a little bit of fuel, try and take that stint as long as he can, like he did in the first race. And he's used that draft down the front stretch front stretch to close it right up. Yeah, back on board again at Baldwin. Bob Cohen couldn't make a move back over Bill Lawrence at last time into Tarzan Corner. Baldwin not close enough, however, to make the move himself either into Tarzan or into Hogan Holt corner. Go back to your battle though for the race lead. It is two attempts of a second. You've got to remember as well, Jos van der Ven right now is only half a second back. By this point, we had seen drivers on pit row for their actual pit stops. You haven't really seen as many drivers do that this time by. Um, we've only had two drivers come in for what is, I'm gonna call a schedule stop, David. The pit road might be very busy in the next lap or so. Yeah, we did see plenty of guys come in at the halfway point uh, last race, and that makes it very easy for you or your crew to do the fuel calculations. Look at how much you burned in the first half, and that's how much you're going to need for the second half. And certainly, you know, 
if you've got a very wide pit window, why not split the race in half? It makes as much sense as some of the other strategies. Yeah, we've just had two lots of side-by-side -side racing. I'm actually going to go back. We're going to replay both of them for you. First one is the driver of Bob Cohen. Out of all, we've got ourselves Rosgood on pit roads. We'll come back to that in a moment. This was actually Kenneth Baldwin and Bob Cohen went side-by-side -side all the way through Mulber Corner and the run down into the Audi S. So what we ended up having is Cohen losing a position and then right behind, I'm going to see if we can see it. There we are. Then we can see Bob Kern um, having a battle going on as well with Paul De Preto. But what we have is the driver of Rosgren on pit road and it is a long stop for Rosgren. It's over 20 seconds for Rosgren. 22.8, that's huge. I'm as surprised as you are right now. I thought maybe he was going to take an early pit stop, try and get an undercut. Maybe he was sick of the traffic, but that looks like something was wrong with the car. Or tires? That's a, a very long stop. Um, we need to check to see if he took tires there, David. I'm but looking right now. Car never went up on the jacks. No tires for Stefan Roskin in that stop. Just 22 seconds held for some reason or another. Under fuel and maybe a speeding penalty could be the answer, trying to be aggressive, but too aggressive maybe on towards pit road itself. Um, it's one of those things, of course, these cars, um, unless I'm very much mistaken, they do have pit limiters, David. So once you actually get to the point of being on pit road, unless I'm mistaken, I do believe they actually have got pit limiters. It's been a while since I've been a pro master. I, th I think so too, but again, I'm also not 100% confident, and when you look at that time, what well, Karkner and Jos van der Ven also on the lane right now, so he's triggered uh, pit stops for all of the leaders, has Stefan Roskin. But, of course, none of these people would necessarily know that the gap, uh, the pit stop time was 22 seconds. So, the top two drivers of Karkner and Jos van der Ven have come on towards pit road. We're just looking at John Unsby then, he'd be having a battle with John Morgan. But let's have a look then, Jos van der Ven out and away. 8.2 seconds, he's been aggressive and he's jumped Karkner as a consequence and Karkner is in traffic as well. He's stuck behind Richard Columboon. Yeah, that two seconds shorter pit stop time for Jos van der Ven has been absolutely critical, getting him out ahead of Richard Coulomb and Remigio de Pasqua. Uh, those two drivers haven't pitted yet, but they're under no obligation to let Stephen Karkner through at this point in the race. Yeah, because of the fact that this is a battle for position. Parkner on towards pit road early. You also find Van, I'm just going to put this into perspective. The next drive in front of him is eight seconds up the road. If Van de Ven wants to go and hammer down some laps, now is his time. As here comes Karkner, going to make the move maybe around the outside of the Vodafone corner. And he should be side by side as they head themselves down towards the Audi S. But I think actually, I'm convinced that Jackson just got off the throttle allowed him to go through the Crown Racing car up into 15th. Yeah, exactly. And we saw that the uh, undercut worked very well for Jos van der Ven in race one. So it could work for him again as we get more pit stops from the lead. El Leroy Coppage into the lane will be hoping that it's not a long stop like he had in the first race. Got my eyes on that one right now. Seven seconds, eight seconds, nine seconds, ten seconds. And now he gets it going, so he's definitely worked that out in this race number two, and he'll come out right behind Jos van der Ven. Yeah, that's actually really good for Coppage, because he Sorry, too... Sorry, Stephen Karkner. Oh, yeah, he, he, he's just come up behind Karkner. So, worth noting that van der Ven, um, just actually having a look, what something's happened to Jos van der Ven. He's on pit road for a second time. That is Absolutely oh. bizarre. He's, he's lost it. He's binned it somewhere on track. There's something wrong with that car. We need to see another look at this. Oh, my word. Van der Ven, huge incident. I think that was around Slavic, actually. We need to get ourselves another look at that. Jos van der Ven, he would have inherited the race lead. There was a, 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 a car. But this is actually into the Audi S. So I take that back. Into the Audi S. No, it wasn't. He lost it all by himself. That wasn't Slavic. Jos van der Ven lost it all by himself in the number 167 machine, binned it down at one of the hardest corners on track. Yeah, and that's a, there's a little bump in the outfield there as well. So he's gone 
over that as well, which has also hurt him. A lot of damage on that car. It's heartbreak for Jos van der Ven, who was coming into this round your points leader. So he's got, I think, a third place in the bag from race one, but race two has not gone his way. Yeah, Manning Grinnan has also had a moment. We just captured that live, and we've seen him come on to pit road now. I believe that was Kumo Corner. He just got himself two wheels onto the grass, David, and just binned it as a consequence. Now, this track does have long runoff areas. Gravel traps. We like gravel traps, of course. Not like Circuit of the Americas and, you know, these tracks now, which is just asphalt all over the place. What we have got is a battle going on for second place. John Morgan and Bill Lawrence. Yeah, precisely. So these guys stand to gain a lot from some of the issues that other drivers have had. Neither of them have come down onto the pit road yet, but they're still quite a few laps away, maybe two or three laps from needing to do so. John Morgan leads Bill Lawrence, and it's just half a second, and closing up a lot more under brakes is Bill Lawrence. Indeed so, that is, we're just continuing to look at that battle for second place. Now, these throws, let's not remember, let's remember even, have not yet pitted. We expect to see them in here, yeah, well, now, if you're John Morgan coming on towards pit road then. Going to slow it down to 60 kilometers an hour. And actually, now I look at it, it does seem to be that there's not a pit limiter in these cars. Um, or at least not ones being used. Can you see the trachometer dancing around? The driver's having to manually deal with the speed limiter here. So let's put the graphic up. For John Morgan, should be about 8 to 10 seconds. It's going to be the higher end. Going to be the much higher end. Going to be maybe a penalty for John Morgan as it goes up to 20 seconds. No, 18.8. .8. So maybe just overfueling that car actually for John Morgan. Not quite sure what's going on with some of these drivers. Worth noting, John Unsby is leading the way in a race spot car. Proof that if you've got race spot on your car, you got at least two tenths per second faster. Exactly, that's why we've uh, added some to my team's car for the DGFX Club Sports Series. Unfortunately, didn't help us in round one, but we're hoping it will later. Um, please give me some good luck, Will. We will give you as much good luck as you need. Of course, the talent is all down to you guys. Danny Hinchin with Joel Martin, a driver who has pitted versus a driver who hasn't pitted. Hinchin has done a pit stop. That time was 9.7 on the gun. Joel Martin has not pitted, and it looks as though this should be an easy move, actually into the Audi S, the number 27 machine of John Martin. Yeah, he's going to concede that position. Uh, sensible driving from John Martin. He knows he's not in that battle, and it's not far behind him that he's got, got people he is in a battle with. So he doesn't need to lose time fighting, which you can do a lot of. You can lose a lot of time fighting too hard. Yep, and just having a look at the time on the gun. For John Unsby, 10.9 seconds. The, the pit time actually went a little bit long there. It was more like 10.5 seconds, but Unsby is out and away. A lot of drivers coming on towards pit road. Your leading driver now is Bill Lawrence, who has not yet pitted. Worth noting, there is a charge A coming, and it is Elway Wide Coppage over Stephen Karkner. Here are the lap gaps. Last time by. Coppage almost three tenths of a second faster than Karkner. The lap before, Karkner was faster than Coppage. The lap before that, of course, we had pit stops come into play. So, we need to keep an eye out on Coppage because that gap has come down again this past lap as we are riding on board with Stephen Karkner right now. You can see from the rear that is El Leroy Coppage behind. Yeah, exactly. Redemption in race two is what Coppage is looking for horrible, horrible pit stop in race one. He's gotten it right in race two. He's absolutely on track for a podium. And I think if he catches Karkner, it could be for a win. Yeah, so the gap comes up then in sector number three. So sector one, sector two, Coppage was clearly faster than Karkner. But as they come past the start finish line, it's going to be interesting. Let's look for the times. Karkner will come past the line. And Coppage faster that last time by, but only by 
half the tenth of a second. Yeah, the slimmest of margins, but now down the front stretch is where Kopech got a little bit of a draft. He doesn't have quite as much of an advantage through these twistier bits here. Great run off Hugenholtz corner for Stephen Karkner. This is now your battle for the lead because Bill Lawrence has pitted, rejoined down in about sixth or so. First position, Stephen Karkner. Second position, El Leroy Coppage. And eight seconds further down the road, the final podium position for third is Mark Robertson. Yeah, indeed so. So it's, it's worth noting that, again, we've got some close battles. Bob Cohen versus John Morgan. That is a close one. We do want to keep an eye out on, actually. Because Morgan's got himself the move done, or has he? Yes, he has. Let's get ourselves a replay of that one. Because this is going to have to be done through our overhead coverage. And I've got a feeling that there is a bit of a loose moment there. Yeah, indeed so. Uh, Bob Cohen had a loose moment on the exit. Who can hold corner? That allowed John Morgan to just go around the outside as they work through the uphill section of the race track. And into Slavic, he had the move complete, David. A little bit of oversteer absolutely compromised the run of Bob Cohen. And I think the move was done by John Morgan uh, before the next corner, really. And now Bob Cohen's going to find himself under threat from Greg Garris, who's right there as well. Yeah, their second replay on board with Bob Cohen. We go back, though, to live footage. Four laps to go. And you're right. The closest battle on track is the driver we're on board with right now. That is Greg Garris. As they come past the start-finish line, Ruskin has set the fastest lap of the day, but he's only in P number five. That long pit stop cost him 10 seconds. He was right around the lead pack. He's been dropped down to fifth, but not too long. He's going to be catching up onto Danny Hinchin. I think he's got time, and Mark Robertson's not far away from that. If Stefan Ruskin can make the passes quick and keep pumping in, wickedly quick laps like that he could find himself on that third step of the podium and salvaging some uh, potentially valuable points he's not going to improve on his haul from race one i think he's just love likes to race here and with jos van der ven out i think that helps roskin's championship quite significantly but he's a racer he's going to want to get those positions if he can yeah we've had a crash and that is mark robertson He's falling down the order. Let's have a look to see what happened to him. Mark Robertson has pinned it at Vodafone Corner. Just running over that curb. Snap over there into the Armco barrier. Now, I've done that on more than one occasion of my time testing at this track. You don't really want to run over the curbs here at this Zanfort track. As we go back, though, to the battle for your race lead because Coppage lost one second that last time by. Scruffy lap, let's uh, find out why, because that's, at this stage in the race, potentially taking him out of the chance of stealing that lead. Yeah, and the last time by, it was 130.8 there for Stephen Karkner. So he was a 10th faster than he'd been the lap before, but Coppage, under pressure, losing a second. We believe that he just overshot down at the Audi S. And Greg Garris, we saw him earlier on. He was charging, he's pushed too hard. And he's binned it. The Texan driver in the number 10 machine into Tarzan corner. I almost expect this to be a run onto. Oh, he just overshot because he's almost going to run into the rear of Bob Kern. Yeah, clearly missed wherever his braking marker was. And he's gone off road rodeo after that. But Stefan Roskin's putting in ridiculously quick laps. He's improved further on his previous fastest lap of the race. His last lap was a 1 minute 30.1. No one even close to matching that right now out there. He's trying to grab that final spot on the podium, Will. Jos van der Ven, having a look at him quickly. He's in 15th place. Of course, he had a disastrous pit stop in the same way that Coppage did earlier on in our evening's webcast in the first race. And again, if you're someone like Van der Ven right now, you might as well just park the car. Let's be honest. But one of the things I like about this series, perseverance to the end. Yeah, a lot of these guys, they know each other pretty well. They're out here for the championship points, sure. But just to have a good race against some, some competitors of a fellow skill level, that's what they're about. They're out here to enjoy some good racing. 
Uh, certainly plenty of talent on show, but it is a little bit like a, a club level event. These guys know each other well, and it's, it's a lot about the enjoyment of racing than it is about the championship points. During a replay of Danny Hinchin losing third place to Stephen Roskin. That was down at Tarzan Corner. Roskin's been on absolute fire since he had that long pit stop. And it gets this. He is currently 10 seconds behind your race leader and his pit stop time was 12 seconds longer than your race leader. Yep, I think a lot of our viewers will be able to do the maths on that one, but he'd be comfortably in the lead uh, if he hadn't had whatever the mishap was with his pit stop. Now he's in the podium positions. We're probably going to speak to him after the race. That's certainly one thing we might uh, query with him. There's your top eight, bottom of the screen. Stephen Cargner leading now by two seconds over El Leroy Coppage. So it looks as though the battle going on with Coppage, that one is not going to materialize as we enter the last lap of this motor race. Stephen Rosgren in third place is just under 10 seconds behind your race leader now. Danny Hinchin in fourth, John Unsby in fifth, Bill Lawrence in sixth, John Morgan in seventh, and Jack Turner rounds out your top eight. But we are into the last lap of our second race. Well, Stephen Karkner, I asked him the question if he was bored in second place last time around. He said no. This time, he has led this race from the front pretty much the entire way around. I'm going to very quickly show you Bill Lawrence versus John Unsby. This is the battle going on for the fifth place on track. And Bill Lawrence has been consistently faster than Unsby over the last three laps. Almost seven times per second a lap faster. However, there's only really, David, two more overtaking opportunities to go. And he's lost one of the three or four on this lap already. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be brave into the Audi S as he overshoots and nearly hits John Unsby. So Bill Lawrence has made some great overtakes already. He's uh, looking for one more. Yeah, into the Audi S. We'll go back and turn your attention over to Stephen Karkner because he's about to take the checkered flag. But first, can Lawrence do anything? The answer is no, not yet into the Audi S, but there still might be more to come. Here is your race winner, Stephen Karkner. Get a second place and trumps it by going up to first in heat number two. However, Lawrence, can he do a drive to the line versus John Unsby? They're close. He looks to the inside, but he's not going to be close enough. Unsby will round out your top five. Fourth place will be Danny Hinchin. Third place, Stefan Rosgren. Second, Ellie Wood Coppage. First place is going to be Stephen Karkner. What well, again, a fantastic run to the line. We've got little battles going on behind as well. We've got a car off. That is Joe Martin there at the end of this one. Let's see a replay of this, David. Let's see what happened. A crash down at the Audi S puts him down outside your top 20. Yeah, heartbreak late in the race for Joel Martin there. Yeah, so let's have ourselves a look at your results for race number two. So Stephen Karkner takes victory by 3.4 seconds, came home second in race one. Goes one better, gets the W in race number two. El Leroy Coppage, I said earlier, needed a top three finish after a disastrous pit stop in the last race. Put him out of contention. He gets second place. Stefan Rosgen had a poor run on pit road, but manages to come home in a podium position outsmarting and outracing Danny Hinchin in the last two laps. Hinchin comes home in fourth. John Unsby holds on by a tenth of a second to claim the fifth position over Bill Lawrence. John Morgan in seventh. Jack Turner in eighth. Paul Prater in ninth. And Kenneth Baldwin rounds out your top ten. There are the remainder of the results. Note, Jos van der Ven, Dan P number 14 after a second pit stop. A couple of disappointing faces then as we had some good battles going on from P11 through 15. But some people more happy, shall we say, than others. And there are the remainder of the results up on the screen for you now. 26 drivers, David, finished on the leading lap. 
that's pretty good if you ask me because it's not an easy circuit uh, as we saw some of the curbs pretty deadly and it's not necessarily an easy car to drive because when the grip goes away from you it really goes away from you so that's a good effort from all of these drivers and they definitely gave us plenty of close racing to go with it yeah neat so there are the last remnants of your results here today we are going to have ourselves opportunities to talk to your top three once again and oh well, he came home second place in the first of our two races david he's the winner of race number two and you're stood by with stephen Clarkner. well stephen i guess improving from race one to race two always what you want to do and with a win in the bag for race two that could potentially move you into the lead of this championship is that something that you've got your eye on or do you just go race by race and enjoy the racing no i've got my eye on that championship it's been a while since i've won it since stefan and josh joined the league so it's uh, about time maybe i took a run at it well, your leader going into this race, Jos van der Ven, I think only managing third place in race one and having some troubles in race two. So his best result this round of third place, you get first. That's definitely uh, an improvement to your championship hopes. Yeah, that's really good. There's a lot of good racers here, so you got to be careful on this track and you got to respect everybody. Was there anything you learned in race one that you brought into race two that helped you get this win? Or was it the same strategy and you just got lucky with it? I think qualifying first is the key here because then you get to pick your starting time, like where, how, when you start the race and how fast you go into corner one. Right, well, congratulations on this race win. Congratulations on those points for the championship and I definitely look forward to seeing you again in the coverage of the final round that RaceBot will be bringing. Uh, while we've got you here, any more thanks? Well, thanks, David, to you and your crew for uh, watching and, and doing this race for us. And congratulations to all the other guys on the podium. Yeah, there we go, Will Vincent. So, a Steve Karkner who's very happy to be moving up the championship standings a little bit. And he's got his eye at the halfway point of the season on maybe grabbing that trophy. Yes, indeed. So, because of some tech issues, we are going to have to try and make these interviews quicker. They might have to disappear to somewhere else. So, um, let's talk to Stefan very quickly. Um, third place, talk us about that pit stop. Yeah, I should have better concentrated more. I was too fast coming in and got a 15 second penalty. Still get third place though in second race, get yourself the fastest lap as well. Um, was you just basically managing your own car, seeing how far you can go after that? Yeah, I, of course I wanted to win, but um, it's difficult to overtake. So I tried to do this with pit stop strategy, but then I got that penalty and then it was done. Uh, thank you very much there to Stefan Ruskin coming home in the third position. Quickly as well, fifth place driver John Unsby um, took us through your race. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, well, man, guys, there's fast guys showing up. Uh, we got a couple of new fast ones, and uh, I'm kind of getting my butt kicked this season. This was one of my best finishes. Well, you came home P number five, but... There's a lot of racing going on around you, and of course, you had to hold on. Very late minute, Bill Lawrence tried to race you to the line. Yeah, he would have had me another lap or two. He he chased me down three seconds in the last three laps, uh, or four laps. Well, thank you very much, John Hansby. Very quickly, anyone want to give a shout out to? No, just thank you guys for covering these races. You do a great job. Well, thank you very much. Of course, we want to give a shout out to Isman Balau, trackcams22.com, Andres Warner, and One Design, Simon Grossman, Actioneering.com, Nick Thyssen for Racebot TV, live timing and scoring. Plenty more racing action to come your way on Racebot TV over the course of this weekend. We have, of course, got ourselves Friday Night Primetime, Formula Renault 3.5. That is Friday at 8 p.m. GMT. Then on Saturday, the Porsche Pro Series will be here. It'll be live, the third round of the championship. Will it be Freddie Raksmusen with G2 Esports, or will it be the driver of 
got Max Pineke, who's almost been dominant in 2018. Will he continue that dominance in 2019? Third round of the Pro Series will be live on Race Bar. And we've also got this small matter of the 24 hours of Daytona as well. But that's all we've got time for here on Racebot TV. Thank you so much to everyone who's been a part of our broadcast. From David Haynes and myself, Will Vinson, goodbye and good night from Zanvor. <laughs>